secfans.com last video in week two it's going to be southern cal and stanford a huge matchup every year and we've done a few games already inside the sec and we're stepping completely outside of the sec with this one we've had fun with stanford and southern cal fans in, in the past and, and we're here to talk about your teams today no sec smack talk we're here to talk about your teams and what we think about this game want to let y'all know that don't be scared to subscribe to us, even though you got a couple of SEC guys talking. We've got, I'd say, half of our subscriber base is probably people from outside the SEC. When we've done Notre Dame or Michigan or Ohio State fan, Ohio State games, um, they've really enjoyed the engagement, and we have too. So, also a reminder: we'd love for you to disagree or agree with us. Let us know what your score prediction is in the comments. We'll certainly engage with you. That's one of the things that we do on this channel. Is we try to engage with every single comment uh, to give our opinions. Feel free to tell us how dumb we are, how wrong we are. Just back your point up with data. It's hard to back up a point with data in week two because we don't have much to go on from week one, Josh. And for those of you who don't follow along, I get nerdy every week with my co-host, Josh. We are a statistics-based channel without a lot of statistics to talk about. By week four, we'll have a computer model. We don't have one right now, but what we can know is last year, Stanford lost to San Diego State. This year, they beat San Diego State. It started out a little touch and go, uh, ended up 31-10, and the Stanford defense was there, um, and that's something that's been a pretty solid staple uh, for the Cardinal the last few years is, is we know they're going to come out and play defense. What concerned me a little bit going into this game or taking my takeaway from this game was that I didn't love the offense. And I know, I know JJ put up a ridiculous game, 200 something yards. His average was over 30 yards a touch on six receptions, three touchdowns. Um, Bryce Love didn't have it. I, I think he's a historically consistent enough performer that his off night doesn't really scare you yet. Um, but it does give me concern when I saw a couple of things. One, Bryce Love, and, and here just for a little backstory, we're talking, we're filming this during the Florida State uh, Virginia Tech game. We're talking about how Cam Akers hasn't really lived up to his potential. Uh, and, and Josh mentioned that it's because the guy's getting hit the second he gets the ball. We saw some of this with Bryce Love and KJ Costello really struggling. Um, it, it's it's kind of cool because Costello is a bit of a gunslinger and he found some ways to make his go out and get his, even though he didn't have a clean pocket. But it, I was a little concerned when I saw the offensive line against the San Diego State team that's not going to be as talented uh, in the front seven, in the front four, as the teams that they face down the line. We saw struggles from Stanford last year. Uh, Oregon State jumps out to me, a team that gave up about 150 points a game last year. They were one of the worst defenses in recent memory, and Stanford really struggled to score at all. And I think Bryce Love was out for that game, but still, it seems like year to year, they're having these consistent offensive struggles. They'll have a game where they break out, and they score 35, 40 points against a good team, but consistently they have these struggles. So I, I want to set the stage for that and talk a little bit about USC and have you digest and let me know what you think about both. And my quick point on USC is we'll talk about JT Daniels in a second. They're starting a new quarterback, true freshman quarterback, had a pretty good, good day against UNLV, but also against UNLV. Their running back, Lexington Thomas, had 136 yards, 9.7 yards per carry. So on the flip side, we've got a Southern Cal team that's found ways to put up points regardless of who's playing quarterback, but they've struggled on defense. So second week in the year, when you've got a team that's struggling on offense but's playing good defense, and you've got a team that's probably going to be able to score some points but struggling on defense early in the year before everything's gelled, which one do you prefer? I guess I should say, which ailment do you prefer to have to go to battle with the most? A bad defense yeah, or a bad I, offense? I, I would personally, I personally prefer a bad offense. I think if you have a bad defense in these sorts of games and you have depth that maybe you can wear somebody down if they can't move the ball. If you've got, if you've got a bad defense, the other team's just going to score and you can be really good and you can lose. And 
Um, that's how Oklahoma loses to Iowa State, right? It is by not playing very good defense. And that's also how Ohio State loses to Iowa, but that doesn't really make any sense in any way. So let's just ignore that point. But yeah, <laughs> yeah I was about to say their their offense was their bad defense because it they get our offense gave up a ton right, of points. Right, exactly. So it, the point being, if, if the other team scores points, then you may lose. It, it's kind of a dumb, obvious point. But the game of football, the point is to score points. And if the other team is scoring, um, then that puts pressure on you to score, and that can cause you to lose the game. If the other team can't really score, probably not going to win. Uh, but, I mean, to your point, both of these games uh, a, a little crazy in, in terms of – how successful or unsuccessful they are. UNLV, the, that 9.7 yard per carry, that's the highest per carry average UNLV has had in a game since New Mexico in 2012. So it's not just like that was good. That was like past five years good for Nevada, Las Vegas against yeah. Southern Cal. And yeah, and it was on 14 carries. It's not like he he had – and he did have one long run, but, you know, it's not like they also had a guy that was 36 yards per carry, but he had one carry. This is a running back, not a running quarterback. This is a running back with 136 yards on 14 carries. And, by the way, their quarterback also threw in another 80. Right, yards. and on the flip side, though, San Diego State. The last time San Diego State held somebody to 1.3 yards per carries was Boise State in 2013. So both teams just gave up a five-year high to their non-conference Cupcakes. cupcake, who usually plays cupcake teams. Um, so we can talk about why these are aberrations. A lot of people can say there's growing pains. I will say I buy that actually more with the offensive line than the defensive line. Sometimes offensive lines come in in game one, and they're just all kinds of screwed up in terms of assignments and a lot of other things, and they're going to go back this week and – spend some time and that can be a little more fixed. I'm probably a little more concerned, even though we talked about what's the worst ailment. I'm probably a little more concerned when a defense can't stop the run in week one, because I don't think that's as easily fixed. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's worth pointing out and it's easy for somebody to discount it, but you really can't. I mean, this was historically high yardage or, or low yardage for both teams compared to their opponents. Um, and, and that that has to be concerning because even on a really, really good day or a really, really bad day, UNLV does not run the ball this well. San Diego State does not stop the run this well ever. Um, so so even if this was a really, really bad day for Stanford and USC, still that's unacceptable. And I know we don't like to go year to year, but if we are talking about the two opponents that Southern Cal and Stanford faced – San Diego State was far less cupcakey in 2017. They actually beat UNLV 41 to 10, and UNLV lost to Howard. So they were they were super bad last year. Um, I don't. I think there's. It's fair to say they're probably not losing to Howard bad again this year. But 43 to 21 to UNLV, and it's not like UNLV put all their points on the scrubs. It was. 1914 at the half. Uh, so, and then Southern Cal put on 24 in the last quarter. And I think a lot of this has to do with Southern Cal starting a true freshman quarterback. It makes sense that he's going to struggle early, regardless of who they're playing. Um, but let's talk a little bit about these two teams. And, 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 you know, really for you, you might, upset a few Stanford fans when I bring this up, but you weren't super high on Bryce Love last year. Um, not to say that you said he was a bad running back, but you thought that the the Heisman discussion was a little unwarranted, if not, you know, just premature. Does this first game sort of validate that, or is it just one game in isolation? And talk a little bit about why you might you weren't quite as high on Bryce Love as as you might have been, or as others might have been. So, I mean, if you've followed this channel, and I, I don't expect many Stanford fans necessarily would tune in week to week, I've been rough on these Stanford uh, 
running back Heisman candidates. And the reason I've been rough on them is the number of touches they get, um, the performance that they have relative to the situations they're put in, um, and the results that come from it. Of the ones that have been put forth, and there's really three, right? You've got Gerhardt, Christian McCaffrey, Bryce Love. I'm the highest on Bryce Love. I think Bryce Love has the potential. I think he can actually break some tackles. I think he's a really fast guy and he's an explosive player. But in particular, Christian McCaffrey had really, really good games against teams where he didn't get touched. He didn't break a lot of tackles. He benefited from an offensive line that would give him a gaping hole against teams that weren't used to stopping the run. Um, and he just bring to daylight. And I, I questioned whether he was really deserving of his hype. We also talked a lot about, about the fact that his all-purpose yardage was fantastic. But if you looked at his pure rushing statistics, they were above average and, and not much more than that. Um, a point being, everybody benefits from the system. Uh, Bryce Love gets a lot of hype. His stats are great. Um, but at the same time, they're great when they play crap competition. You know, San Diego State, he had 14 yards per carry. Rice, he had 14 yards per carry in 2017. Um, and, I mean, he had some good games in conference opponents. UCLA, Utah, Oregon, though none of those teams were particularly good in 2017. But when they played elite competition, top 15 teams or just ranked teams in general, you know, Washington, he's 5.5 yards per carry. Notre Dame, 6.2. Southern Cal, 5.7. TCU 5.6. All those are solid performances, but they're not, not a single one of them are really um, groundbreaking. And, and he had some big runs in those games too, that made the average higher. He wasn't an overly consistent back when playing elite teams. So that's why I'm maybe a little negative. I, I will push back and say that uh, the one I was really negative against really was Christian McCaffrey. Um, and that's, uh, really due to the fact that I, Christian McCaffrey, again, his rushing stats, um, they just didn't match what you would expect to see from a guy uh, that you want to be in the Heisman. You know, his big Heisman year 2015, he averaged under six yards a carry. Bryce Love did better than that. Um, but uh, I do think that the running backs at Stanford are a genuine product of the system. That's not to say it's ineffective. It's not an insult to the player. I think Bryce Love is a very good running back, um, but he's going to have a ton of yardage. He's going to have elite production, and it, it's probably just not reflective of who he is so much as the scheme is or the team is. And to your point, wrapping all this back around, what's curious a curiosity to me is, is Bryce Love effective if the offensive line isn't dominant? Because if you want to say this guy really is a Heisman winner, I want to see him have really good production no matter the circumstance, um, even if he were on a bad team. Uh, and if he gets completely shut down when his offensive line starts to struggle, uh, I, I, I do think that's at least some sort of an indictment on uh, whether or not you should consider him a Heisman contender. So we've talked in previous game previews that we've done, especially with teams like Georgia, um, some with Alabama, about there's some teams that do kind of reload year to year. Some teams really struggle to replace productivity from the previous season. And we look last year, USC beat Stanford twice. The second one was a very close game where Bryce Love actually did have a good game. Costello had an actually an okay game. But on the other side, USC, USC, if we're talking about these two teams coming together and replacing what they lost from the year before, the the quarterback, top running back, and top wide receiver are all there for Stanford. And you look on the flip side, there's no Sam Darnold. There's no Ronald Jones. Michael Pittman Jr. is still there um, at wide receiver, but that's a lot of production to replace. And like we've said with Georgia fans, and I'm curious if you think this is more analogous to Georgia or to Alabama, Southern Cal recruits on a high level. Not top one, two, but a high level. So is this a situation where you see Sam Darnold, Sam Darnold and Ronald Jones – not being replaced at all this year and them really struggling or them kind of not skipping a beat. Like 
Georgia fans think that they will, and we secretly don't think they will, or somewhere in between where, you know, true freshman quarterback and then a couple of running backs that have been in that system for a while gel over time, and maybe they're not the team in week two that they will be in week 10. And I know that's that's an easy thing to say that for everybody, but for some teams relative to personnel, it's particularly acute. How do you see this USC offense replacing all that production? Personally, I, I was probably higher than Sam Darnold than some. Uh, and I know these are two pack teams and they're going to see SEC fans and assume we're homers. I swear we're not as much as you just sort of needled me into criticizing Bryce Love because you knew that was a pain point. Um, <laughs> I thought Sam Darnold was a very good quarterback. And personally, I thought a lot of USC success the past couple of years was due more to Sam Darnold than was credit was given. Um, particularly when they had a they had a comeback win against Texas. Um, and I really felt like if you switch Sam Darnold with almost any other quarterback, USC loses that game easily. And that said a lot about Darnold to me. And I, and there were a lot of times I felt like he got a, a lot of uh, pain for mistakes he made or throws he made where I felt like he was put in difficult situations. And why do I say that? Because JT Daniels is a really good quarterback and there's a lot of evidence that he's going to be a really good quarterback. I don't think he's Sam Darnold yet. And I don't think he's, you know, multi-year starter Sam Darnold yet, certainly. So it's asking a lot for this USA offense to operate at that high of a level, given how high I was in the guy that came out last year. Um, I, and, you know, there's already some evidence in the NFL that maybe Ronald Jones, maybe he isn't that much of a loss. And we talk about this a lot in the SEC because they, they, they love to pride themselves on their NFL draft picks. I don't view it as a good thing in a lot of ways when your team has a lot of really high draft picks or when they, they exceed expectations, because if you have guys that are going a lot higher in the draft than you expect, that means your team probably honestly underachieved with those players versus what they should have been. Cause the NFL is looking at your team and going, yeah, I know that you, you know, you didn't put up all that many passing guards last year, but dad gummit, your receivers are really good. And uh, you know, the opposite can happen. If they look at your team, if you have a team that's really highly touted, you lose guys and they don't get drafted high and teams freak out about that. Well, that means the NFL is looking at your guys and go, we don't think the guys you lost were actually all that important or all that good. Um, and we can put two of these things together because you know, we talked offline about this. Alabama last year, um, they lost a bunch of guys in offense, a bunch of guys in defense. The corners Alabama lost are struggling to make a practice squad. And two of the receivers, Cam Sims and uh, Robert Foster, yeah, are, are, are going to make 50 or just made 53 man rosters in the NFL. And that was just kind of an interesting thing to us when they were talking about what NFL players landed and didn't land it, that, uh, you know, these Tony Brown and uh, Levi Wallace starting corners from this great defense didn't end up in the NFL and the receivers are, it was kind of an interesting sign. And we, we kind of tracked that for this reason, because that was a sign that maybe Alabama's defense might not have lost quite as much as we thought. And it may be a sign that Alabama's offense should have been quite a bit better last year and was held back more by the quarterback than we thought, um, which kind of seems to make sense given what Alabama looked like against Louisville um, along the same lines, Ronald Jones performance in the NFL. I think if I'm a USC fan, as much as you hate it for the kid, it's actually a good thing. Um, that means that, to a certain extent, maybe just maybe uh, he wasn't as important as you think. And he was more of a product of the, the sort of hosses you have on the offensive line in the system in general, where vice versa, Sam Darnold may have been a pretty significant loss for your offense. And I, I know that's really hypothetical and wishy-washy, but this is the problem when we're in week two. Um, I can only give you so much out of the UNLV game. I'm not going to read too much on how good these players are or not with that level of competition, but at least looking at the NFL and how those guys turned out at that level, that gives me some sort of data point, something objective I can point to and talk about what USC's lost. And then we can kind of project where they'll be with the new guys. 
Yeah, and I, you know, for me, I was high on Ware even from the Alabama game a, a couple of years ago. He didn't have a whole lot of touches. I think he had like five or six carries. But going into that game, I was pretty high on him. Coming out of that game, I was high on him and Jones both. Um, I do worry a little bit if I'm Southern Cal that, like you said, and you made a really good point in that Southern Cal was a good team last year. They won a bunch of games last year. They beat Stanford twice, but they beat Stanford twice the second time by three points with a quarterback who's in the NFL now with a quarterback who went in the first round. And so, yes, you might have a guy who is that next man up that might be somebody special down the line. It's a tough ask to say, okay, you're replacing Sam Darnold. Don't skip a beat. And so I think there's an opportunity there to not skip a beat, but you've got to make a case for, okay, we're not skipping a beat as a team because we're covering our step back at quarterback with a better running back or more wide receivers or a far better offensive line or a defense that's dominant that wasn't dominant last year. I don't think you can say any of those things. You might be able to say them hypothetically on paper, but you can't say them as fact. And you can't point to a trend going through the year last year where Southern Cal defensively was becoming dominant. They gave up 24 to Ohio State, which Ohio State, I wasn't high on that offense last year. They gave up 28 to Stanford a game before that. I don't think giving up 28 to Stanford is is a good sign uh, defensively. So for me, I am scared. I, like you, think it's a good sign that Ronald Jones, for this USC team, isn't just tearing it up. Uh, we saw some drop off with Geis at LSU when Fournette left. Uh, we saw a lot of drop off where everybody, even Geis himself, was saying there's not going to be any drop off, and we saw it. So, so there's some concern there. Um, but talk about the flip side of this, where you've got a Stanford team coming in that knows they can play close to this USA USC team with all that star power, and they're bringing guys to the table that were all there yet last year, especially at the skill positions. Um, talk about the mentality there for a Stanford team uh, that, that's got those all, all those weapons returned. Well, in the early season, it's definitely an advantage. Uh, college football has gotten to the point now. They don't do two days anymore where they don't have a lot of practice reps. And obviously guys have been off for months. I get that. But the fact when you're in the first, let's say, three weeks of the season, things can get a little weird where teams – have a lot of experience and a lot of guys that played a lot of football together tend to beat teams that didn't, even if they're not as good. Stanford has that. I mean, they've got the major pieces from last year. They're intact. They know how to play football. They know how they work together. They know the schemes and that's an advantage. And that it is something of a serious advantage. And, uh, you know, it, it may well be that USC by the end of the year, you know, if they played Stanford again, might win the game handily, even if Stanford wins this game now, just because Stanford goes into this game with a higher baseline, so to speak, from a consistency perspective, right? The the stupid interceptions, the stupid fumbles. Um, I'm not even, you know, we're not even touching on the fact that these guys are good and they are good, um, but we're not touching on it so much because we know who Costello, Love, and our Sega Whiteside are to a certain extent. Um, and that's the point. Um, the fact that you know who they are and you know what performance looks like is a decided advantage in the first few weeks. Um, when you see some teams that, you know, like LSU and Miami, uh, we, we did this whole video on it and we, we took a lot of crap, honestly, from uh, Miami fans because we weren't willing. Which is nothing new. Yeah, that's nothing new if you're. They hate us. If you've experienced Miami fans, it's, it's not really surprising <laughs> on, the, on the interwebs. But we we kept pointing to the fact that Miami lost key players at a lot of different positions. And we said, it's, it's a tall order to play LSU that has, you know, it, it, and a, a lot of times it's kind of interestingly the same, the, the opposing unit for LSU had experience and talent and it was an unproven unit for Miami. And we said, this could go really badly, even though I don't think Miami's as bad as they looked in that opener, frankly, I, I, I don't, maybe they are a terrible team. Um, but when you got a lot of non, young unproven starters, Weird stuff happens. LSU did not statistically beat Miami by that much in that game. The game statistically was pretty close. LSU was pretty lousy. And they win by scoring 33 points. I mean, what was it, like 33-6 final, right? It was 33-17, so, but at one point before they put on a couple of late 
garbage time touchdowns, it was uh, 33 to three, I think. Right. So that's the kind of stuff that happens when you don't have consistent players. That's why there's an advantage to having consistent players. Stanford has consistency at important positions on offense. Um, and that, that helps a lot. And that should mean that Stanford should be able to get consistent production. Um, of course, assuming that they're not the kind of team that puts up 1.8 yards per carry on San Diego state. <laughs> so let's, let's continue this narrative that may be a completely false narrative, but we don't have a lot of data to go on end of the year. It may be flipped that Stanford's defense isn't great, but their offense because of these guys that are coming back and that are experienced and Bryce love is good. Um, that they actually are a good offense, but let's, let's go with the narrative right now that even though Southern Cal has some new pieces, including at quarterback, they're stronger offensively than Stanford is. And even though we don't have a lot of data to go on, we're going to assume Stanford is the better defense. If you're Southern Cal and you Picture how this game plays out before it plays out. And you know you've got a true freshman quarterback, and you know you've got some new pieces that you're relying on to be starters. And you talk about low score variability. If you know this about your quarterback, who might struggle on the road against Stanford, uh, against a good defense, do you want a higher scoring game or do you want? a and let's let's change it around a little bit are they more likely to win the game if the score is 37 31 or if the score is 17 14 given all that we know about this new quarterback and new pieces i think they're probably more likely to win the lower scoring game i think 17 14 game and and the reason is exactly what i was just talking about if you're in a high scoring game and you have a young unproven quarterback there's going to be some point in this game where JT Daniels does something stupid or misses an opportunity because he's new and it's not a crack on Daniels. I can't think of any quarterback in any major game that that's not true of in the national title last year when Alabama was playing Georgia and they put two in, in the second half. First thing I'll note as an aside is we have been given for about three games in a row with Alabama. We'd given a score if, and if they played Tua in a half or more, and if they had not played Tua in a half or more, based off what we'd seen him from him just in garbage time. Uh, but Alabama, bafflingly, in, in retrospect, chose not to play him until the last possible moment. He actually missed some really big throws in that game. They had guys open down the field a few times. They could have broken that game open a lot faster. Um, and that's what happens when you have a guy that hasn't played meaningful snaps yet, no matter how good he is. Uh, and so... If you're in a shootout, it, can they win a shootout? I mean, it, it's this is all super hypothetical, so maybe sure. You know, the score doesn't necessarily mean anything. But if you're in a high-scoring game, generally I'm going to take the more experienced, proven quarterback uh, to win the game in a high-scoring game because push comes to shove, pressure's on. That's when defenses get creative. That's when defenses do things they don't normally do. They catch the quarterback in a trap. The more experience you have as a quarterback – the less likely you are to pull the trigger on some sort of, uh, you know, robber coverage, um, throw an interception that loses you the game. Um, so I do think a lower scoring game where you lean more on the defense is more beneficial to us. All right. Since we don't have a lot to go on, we don't have a computer model. We've got two cupcakes in week one. And I keep saying cupcake. It's not entirely fair. San Diego state's a better program than, than cupcake city, but they're still not an elite program. They're not Southern Cal. Uh, who who Southern Cal is right now? They're 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 cupcake plus, I should say. Um, since we don't know a lot about either one of these teams, I, I think it's time we could talk more about hypotheticals. But let's talk about what we think is going to actually happen. Um, and we like to do this from time to time. We've done it a few times already. Um, but let's talk first. If if Southern Cal wins this game, what's the headline going to be? on Sunday morning as to what they did to win the game and what's the score look like. If Southern Cal wins this game, um, it, it's going to be that they, they played Southern Cal football. They ran the ball decently well. They had an effective passing game and the defense was stout. I think Southern Cal's goal here is going to be a balanced team. And if, if Southern Cal can't be 
uh, a balanced team, then I don't know that they're going to be successful. And it just, honestly, from what we've seen from them, it's hard right now for me to pin down who offensively for Southern Cal is the impact guy. You've already named the fact that Ware is somebody that's highly impressive and he might be the guy, but we don't know that's the case. So it's, it's, it's such conjecture for me to say what it looks like. But the one thing I can say is, uh, I think Holton wants this to be a balanced offense, and I think they want to play hard-nosed defense. And I think those two things need to come together, and they need to win something like you know a 31-20 game if they want to win it. They don't want to be in a shootout, and they don't want to be all run. They don't want to be all pass. They want it to be an average scoring game where maybe they hold the other team to less points, but they just kind of want to be balanced, hit that 25 to 35-point range where you have good offensive production and hopefully hold the other team under that. Okay, so if Stanford wins the game, what's what's their headline for winning the game? Is it Stanford does something great, um, or is it USC stubs their toe with new quarterback at at the helm? I think if Stanford wins the game, the headline's going to end up being Bryce Love and. We spent a lot of time ranking Stanford for that 1.8 yard per carry line. But based off what I saw from that game and just the way it all turned out, UNLV, you know, played Stanford or USC pretty straight up and they lost. And I think San Diego State took a gamble and said, we're not going to let USC play USC football or excuse me, Stanford play Stanford football. We're going to stop Bryce Love and, and let him make us beat them make them beat us some other way. Right. And, and you can do that if you're a reasonably good team. And that's where you said, as you were noting San Diego state, it's not a complete cupcake. They stopped Bryce love. They made Stanford throw the ball. And what Stanford essentially said in that game was, okay, if you completely sell out and, and you take, put us in a situation where you've got our Sega white side and single coverage down the field, we're going to throw the ball up to him and he's going to catch it. And we're going to score three touchdowns with one receiver blow this game open and beat you 31 to 10. I don't think USC is going to take that risk. They're, they're going to, as I said, play this a straight up game. And I think in a straight up game, Costello isn't going to be effective enough to win on his own. So you need Bryce love to win it. I don't think they're going to sell out to stop Bryce love. So he's going to have the opportunity to do so. So if they win the game, it's going to be because Bryce love runs the ball well and he's successful. And if he isn't running it well and it's successful, um, I, I, I think at that point, Costello isn't going to be able to pass the ball well enough because, again, uh, most teams most teams aren't going to sell out so much that you have it back at 1.8 yards per carry if the quarterback is throwing for 10.7 yards per attempt. At that point, they're going to back off and defend the pass. I just think San Diego State felt like they couldn't afford to do that. All right, so... Let's, we've looked at ifs on both sides. Tell me what's actually going to happen. So, you know, and this is one of the more difficult picks for me, and I don't really have much confidence in it, really, in either way. But, um, you know, push come to shove, I think Stanford wins this game. And the reason I feel like they win it, it we've got a very, uh, a very movable object. In, in Southern Cal's defense from week one and a very little amount of force on the other side from what we saw out of Stanford's running game. But of those two things, the one thing I know is last year, Bryce Love did run the ball quite well. So from what limited information I have and really the one key matchup, um, we have one team that showed a weakness in an area that another team, even though they were really weak in week one, at least was very good the year prior. Uh, so I feel like, you know, maybe there's an opportunity there for Stanford to get the run game going with a high level of effectiveness. And then especially given the fact that this was within the first three weeks of the season, that Stanford returns all these returning starters. Um, I do think Stanford has a chance to win this game. Now, I don't I don't think this is going to be uh, an easy win by any means. I My prediction for this would be 31-27 Stanford over USC. Um, but I do think they probably hold the edge right now. Uh, and, and again, anytime we, we talk about this a lot, if, if we think the score is within a touchdown, 
what we're essentially saying is that one punt return or kick return could easily decide the game. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I guess we saw that last week where we both had the Notre Dame-Michigan game within a score. Michigan's starting safety gets knocked out of the game. Winbush hits a big touchdown pass, and they end up winning the game by a touchdown. I mean, that's – we were split on that game. And and if you want to look at it one way, it's whether or not Winbush connects on that one pass decides the entire game, quite possibly. Uh, I don't think that's out of the question here, and I don't think it's cheap for us to say that because a lot of what this channel is doing is trying to identify things we think are interesting in the statistics so you know what to look for in this game. You have something for water cooler talk. Uh, and that's that's kind of where I'm at. I think Stanford right now has an edge early, but I also throw it in the caveat that I, I don't know if that would be the case if they played again. It's just the case right now in week two. Yeah, I've got I've got Stanford also. Um the the rushing performance still scares me. I, I agree with your point that San Diego State basically went into this and said, we're going to force you. It's kind of like what we saw teams do to Jalen Hurts. They're like, Jalen Hurts as a runner and Alabama as a running team is not going to beat us. We're going to leave uh, island coverage, single safety. We're going to walk our safeties up, zero coverage. Um and make you beat us where we're willfully exposed in the back half of the defense because you're not going to run on us. I saw some of that. You still got to be able to run if you're a Heisman Trophy candidate, even if you have some struggles on the offensive line against San Diego State and it didn't happen. Um, but some of that does somewhat soften my concern there. Um, my bigger concern is Southern Cal's on the road true freshman quarterback, which Southern Cal should not be in this place. They should not be in a place where they're starting a true freshman quarterback, but they are. Alabama was a couple years ago, and it was bad. Um, just just as a sidebar, Jalen Hurts starting at Alabama two years ago uh, when he basically came in and took over in the Southern Cal game signaled a bad quarterback recruiting and development problem that Alabama had under Nick Saban for years. They got lucky with Tua. Um, so that was, a, that was a, just an aside, but that's what scares me a little bit about Southern Cal. They shouldn't be in this position. I think over the year, Southern Cal improves dramatically offensively because we did see enough from JT to know that he is going to be a capable quarterback. I think by the end of the year, my score is a lot different on this. Maybe even picking Southern Cal right now. I've got Stanford. Give me Stanford 27, Southern Cal 17 with a caveat that by the end of the year we could potentially be flipping that score what do you think yeah I mean, it comports what i more or less with what i was saying i think this the point production here is is really hard to peg and and, and we this is why we like having a computer model because ours gives us some idea of what the expected yardage and scoring output should look like for these two teams and it's just hard as heck when they played garbage teams to open the season and with one team replacing most of the key components in their offense. So it's just a lot of fun things going on, but I totally agree that however they play in this game, whether USC wins or loses uh, at the end of the day, USC didn't want to be in this game in week two um, and where they're at at the end of the season, this may be a very, very different ball t- uh, ball club. Uh, and, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure that Stanford, you know, whether they meet or not, again, uh, is going to be capable of beating USC at the end of the season. But that doesn't really matter. What matters is what they are, where they're at right now. And right now, I think Stanford has the edge. And look, Southern Cal fans, um, feel free to disagree with us in the comments and let us know what you think. But also know that even if you do lose this game, you are st- <laughs> you still control your own destiny for the Pac-12 championship. And you can still have playoff aspirations especially we saw auburn last year they had two losses going into the sec championship game and they were ranked number two in the country um so if you can make a case the committee looks at the whole body work they look at things like injuries and where players were and player development and where you were at the beginning of the season versus the end of the season so um even if everything we're saying is true and it all happens and you lose to stanford uh, that doesn't mean you're out of anything. And that's one of the good things. So probably the worst thing about this game for Southern Cal is the fact that it's the second week of the season, but it's also the best thing about this game for Southern Cal. 
Right, and and big point too is Notre Dame beating Michigan could be huge for USC uh, because they end their they end their season with Notre Dame. If Notre Dame continues to improve and and play good football, uh, that's a potential top ten matchup to end the season when we think USC is going to be really good. So just like Auburn and how they beat Alabama at the end of the regular season and the position that put them in, um, USC can ass- afford one, p- quite possibly even two stumbles along the way. Um, and then be able to close out by beating Notre Dame. And let's say they lost to Stanford early and then they thump them in the conference championship game. The playoffs committee is going to go, well, that, that first loss, maybe we can kind of excuse that because they're clearly a completely different team. We, we see that now. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think uh, whatever early season issues they have, if they exist or not, um, are, are going to be overcome or are going to be able to be overcome due to the schedule and the opportunities to come across uh, later in the season. Notre Dame's an interesting point, and we keep wanting to end it and keep coming up with new things to say. But Notre Dame's an interesting point because on paper right now, they're favored in every other game on their schedule but Southern Cal. Every single one between here and Southern Cal, they will be favored, maybe Stanford. Um, but I could see them, if you look at every, if you look at their schedule right now, they're going to be coming into that Southern Cal game either 11 and 0 or 10 and 1 which means they will be poised to take a playoff spot away from the Pac-12 champion, depending on how that shakes out, or from someone else. So you're right. It is a huge opportunity for Southern Cal because if they can, if they lo- lose this game, they beat Notre Dame, they followed up with a Pac-12 championship win, they're not out of anything. So guys, don't get down too much on us and our pick. I, I, think, I think this is... Just just getting started on your year. Win or lose. If you win, you still might have to beat them again. So, um, y'all, I think that's it for us this week. We are tired and talked out. Labor Day weekend. Had family in town on Josh's end. And I've got two kids under three years old. So, uh, I'm always sleepy. So, uh, thanks for sticking with us this long. For you podcasters, you might have listened to a lot of content many hours of content this week because we actually went way long on our other two from yesterday so thanks so much y'all have a great week god bless comment 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 give us your corporate citizens and uh subscribe thanks y'all